everyone. I am Kimberly, the 5-Minute NP. The 5-Minute NP was born out of my belief that small, incremental changes can drastically change the trajectory of your life. Our genes do not have to determine our lifespan. My goal through this podcast is to act as a roadmap that bridges the gap between knowledge and action, leading to you living your healthiest, happiest, longest life. Welcome to the 5-Minute NP Podcast. Hi everyone, my name is Kimberly Hefner and this is the 5 Minute NP Podcast, where I believe that small daily incremental lifestyle changes make real life impact. In this episode, the popular Jen Stevens, New York Times bestselling author of Delay, Don't Deny, Fast, Feast, and Repeat, and her latest Cleanish, joins me to answer some of the many questions I received from our last interview on intermittent fasting and to discuss highlights from her latest book, Cleanish which is all about reducing the toxins within our body and embracing a cleanish lifestyle. Thank you all for being here. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. Welcome to the 5-Minute NP Podcast. Enjoy this episode. Hi, Jen. Happy to talk with you again. Well, hey, I'm so glad to be here today. Yeah. Um, so I thought we could talk a little bit, th- for those that you don't know it, that don't know you, if we could just tell a brief who you are and about your books and your podcast real quick, just a summary of who you are and what you do. Absolutely. So my name is Jen Stevens, Jen like gin and tonic, Stevens with a PH, <laughs> just to make it clear. Because right. you have something like J-E-N, no, G-I-N. <laughs> and um, you know, I am a person who struggled with weight for a long time and solved my weight issues through intermittent fasting. Um, and gosh, it's been a lot of years now, but I lost over 80 pounds with intermittent fasting, um, 2014 to 2015 after years of yo-yoing and actually I was obese, um, for, for part of that time. And, you know, I'm a smart person. I have a doctorate in gifted education and a master's in um, natural sciences. And I was successful at every aspect of my life, except my weight. And it was so frustrating. And I was reading everything and trying everything. And thank goodness for intermittent fasting that that helped me finally lose the weight. And I've never yo-yoed again, which is also astonishing. I've been maintaining in this goal range since 2015. And we're now in 2022. Um, Intermittent fasting is the only thing that allowed me to lose weight and keep it off for this many years. So, you know, I was an elementary teacher. You know, I mentioned my degrees are education based. And so I was just, you know, living my life, doing intermittent fasting. And of course, people started to ask me about it, friends and family members. So that led to me starting some very small Facebook groups intended to support my friends and family that ended up growing and growing and growing. Um, it led me to write my first book, self published, Delay Don't Deny, Living an Intermittent Fasting Lifestyle, which um, was it was a great bestseller. I, I was shocked at how well that did. And then I wrote Fast Feast Repeat, which became a New York Times bestseller and went on to do podcasts. Right now, um, Intermittent Fasting Stories. You can find me on that twice a week. And I interview intermittent fasters from around the world. And it's just really grown into a second career I wasn't expecting. At my heart, I'm still a teacher. You know, I'm not a um, doctor, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not in healthcare in any way. But what I what I'm good at, what all teachers are good at, is learning information, taking the content, and re-delivering it to other people. So, you know, my, my gift as a teacher has been getting the message out there about intermittent fasting in a way that people understand. Uh, I totally see it in your books. You are so clear. You provide so much information and you just have a great way of delivering that information. It's easy to understand. And yeah, so I, I see your gift in your writing through being a teacher. Yeah, I'm just delivering <laughs> content. That's what I was trained to do. It could be content about, you know, grammar or <laughs> Yeah, no, no, it's good. Or intermittent fasting, right? Yeah, I know. I mean, seriously, I, I've loved your books and I'm really looking forward to talking about this late, latest one. Um, so our last interview was all about intermittent fasting. It was super popular, but it also generated a lot of questions. So I thought we could just touch on some of those questions Absolutely. real quick for those people that keep asking them. Um, so the first one that I tend to see is how do you overcome plateaus with fasting? Well, that's a great question. And it really depends on like, how long have you been plateaued? Are you at a plateau that is a weight that is actually your body's naturally 
happy weight. For example, a lot of people, you know, might have a weight in their mind that is not going to be a sustainable weight for their body long term. You can get there, but you're not going to be able to maintain there unless you really, really diet and keep your yourself restricted. So you, you have to think about that first of all. Could I be at a weight that is just my body's happy weight? You know, think back throughout your whole life. Have you ever been able to, in your adult life, maintain lower than where you are right now? for a long period of time? If the answer is yes, then you could probably get past this plateau. But if the answer is no, I've never in my entire adult life been able to maintain lower than this weight ever, that might be your body telling you something. I mean, you can look back generations of your family. You know, family members are built a certain way. You know, my husband looks exactly like his dad. You know, he's got his dad's frame, his dad's body. His body naturally gravitates to a certain weight. And it's really hard to, to go against that. You can, but but it's not easy. Now, let's say you know you can be smaller and you want to be and you're not at the size you'd like to be and you know your body has been there before and can maintain there. You just need to really think about, you know, what what are you you able to change at this time in your life? And when it comes to fasting, there's really just three things. You can change, um, you know, your fasting like if you're doing daily um, time-restricted eating with a daily eating window, you can work on that daily eating window. You can adjust at different times of the day. You can make it a little longer. You can make it a little shorter. Um, you can also adjust the intermittent fasting protocol that you're using. We have something called alternate daily fasting. They're different you know, hybrid approaches where you can mix in alternate daily fasting with daily eating windows you know, change up your fasting protocol. The third thing to really focus on is what you're eating. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, my first book was called Delay, Don't Deny. Everybody loves that don't deny part, but you can eat more food and you can eat the wrong kinds of food that will not work well for your body. Now, I'm not saying, you know, that there's like wrong food out there that's wrong for everybody or that you should never have birthday cake or (laughs) <laughs> you know, any anything like that, because we want to enjoy our lives. But you have to get honest with yourself and think, am I eating foods that nourish my body and that will help me reach my goals? Right. I have a chapter in Fast, Feast, Repeat that's a plateau chapter, and it really asks a lot of questions for the reader to go through. Mm-hmm. You know, some things cause plateaus like hormonal changes of menopause yeah. or you know, if someone has, um, you know, hormonal issues with their thyroid, for example, all sorts of things come into play. Fasting does not, you know, fix all problems. Right. It does a lot of great things, but, you know, it's not going to make you, um, you know, your estrogen level suddenly higher if you're on the other side of menopause, for example. Right. So there are a lot of things that you might have to dig into. Intermittent fasting is fantastic at what it's good at. Um, But Dr. Jason Fung said it really well. Obesity is multifactorial, which means lots of little parts. And intermittent fasting works on certain parts of it beautifully, but it isn't the only answer. Right. That makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of hormones, I wanted to ask you, how does fasting affect hormones? And is it different um, like premenopausal? Should we be fasting differently throughout cycles if you still are having cycles or premenopausal, menopausal? I know that's a lot of loaded questions right there. It is. And hormones is a big word because there are a lot of hormones that are not like sex hormones. Like, for example, insulin is a hormone and intermittent fasting is the number one best thing you can do to bring down your insulin levels, which is what we want. We want our insulin levels to be low. Um, I just read a, a recently a great book called Why We Get Sick by Dr. Benjamin Bickman. Have you read that one yet? No. I'm you got to get that one. It's so good. But it connects high levels of insulin and insulin resistance to so many problems that we're going through right now. You know, you look around you and you see everyone who's not doing very well health-wise. It might even be, you know, someone who's listening. Yeah. You probably have insulin resistance, so you want to get your insulin down, and that is like the number one thing. Um, also, for example, you know, to tie insulin in with female hormones, someone who has PCOS, for example, high insulin levels. So, a lot of people with PCOS, you know, have infertility problems. I interviewed an OBGYN on intermittent fasting stories way back, I think, in. I don't know, maybe 2018, Dr. Cecily Ganhart. Someone can go back and find that episode. And she's an OBGYN who uses intermittent fasting with her patients. 
And she finds that her patients, especially the ones with PCOS, have increased fertility after adopting intermittent fasting. So, you know, the idea that, oh my gosh, fasting is bad for female hormones, that's not true. You know, what's bad for female hormones is over-restriction, over-dieting. And so I, I always think it's so interesting because people tend to assume that intermittent fasting equals over restriction. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Um, When when you read fast, feast, repeat, I mean, it's fast, feast, repeat. There's a whole third of the book, a whole section on the feast and the nourishing your body well part. So Mm -hmm. I would actually say that what's much worse is following the the typical dietary advice of, oh, you know, restrict yourself to 1200 calories a day and make sure you're working out hard. That is way worse for our hormones than intermittent fasting and nourishing your body well during the eating window. So because I don't equate intermittent fasting with being overly restrictive, I do not buy into the idea that we've got to do something different around our cycle. Um, you know, we've seen so many people who had trouble with fertility, then they adopt an intermittent fasting lifestyle and now they're pregnant. So, I mean, I'm not a doctor again, like I said, so I'm not giving you medical advice, but I have seen, you know, miracle stories out there of people who've had increased fertility after a long time of trying. So I, I can't believe it would be bad for us when so many people are having amazing benefits. What we don't want to do is over-restrict through any type of paradigm, that's not good for our bodies at all. Um, You know, if you're like barely eating and also doing CrossFit, I mean, there are a lot of people who are living that lifestyle, not intermittent fasting, but eating, you know, six times a day, tiny, tiny meals. That's really hard on your body. So focus on nourishing your body well. You know, I'm a big believer in listening to your body and, you know, I'm on the other side of menopause now, but before I got here, I was, you know, several, had several years of intermittent fasting before I got to, to menopause. And I always had like one day a month when I was just starving mm-hmm. and I'd be like, why am I so hungry? What? And I would just eat more. And then the next day my period would start. And I'm like, okay, that's why. But I mean, literally every month I was surprised. By yeah. That. But I listened <laughs> to my body and I ate more. So, I mean, mm-hmm. we've got amazing feedback mechanisms if we learn to listen to our bodies. Well, you know, influencers, there's some influencers that I follow that really say, like, if you're having hormonal imbalances, do not intermittent fast, which is why I wanted to ask you about it. Right. And then also, okay, during this part of your cycle, you need to pulling fast this part. You don't need, I'm like, oh my gosh, who can keep up with it? That's a lot of work. It's really complicated. And our bodies are wise, you know, animals out in the wild are not like, I mean, they know how to live. They just live, you know? Right. Right. And and with, with intermittent fasting, we get back in tune with our body's hunger and satiety signals. You know, we're not like, you know, pushing through hangriness all day long. We're not, you, you become to, you get to the point with intermittent fasting, like right now, you know, it's two in the afternoon. I haven't eaten yet. I'm fasting. I'm fine. I have great mental clarity. I have great energy. No problem at all. Back before when I was obese, first of all, that wasn't very good for my hormones to be obese. Well, that's true. You're right. But I was hangry all the time. I needed breakfast. I needed a mid-morning snack. I needed a, you know, lunch and afternoon snack. I was always crashing. My blood sugar was up and down, up and down. That was terrible, terrible for my body. So, you know, I I can't say that that would be better for someone to think, well, I better not do intermittent fasting. That might be a problem. The way so many people are living is so much worse for your body in in so many ways. You know, if you've got abdominal fat, for example, a lot of, you know, your, your waist circumference is really high you know, that's, that's a huge problem. That's going to impact you in so many ways with your health down the line. So don't be afraid of intermittent fasting women. And you don't need, we're not, you know, such delicate flowers that, that we, we can't fast. I will say if you're overly restricting and you lose your period, that's not a good sign, but people do that through every type of diet. They over restrict. We don't want you to do intermittent fasting in a way that's overly restrictive. That's not recommended. So what do just, you think about, um, sorry, I didn't mean to get too Oh, long. no, that's fine. So what do you think about the um, moving the fasting window later in the day? Because I've read, um, you know, your cortisol level, your stress levels are high in the morning. 
and fasting is a stressor. So do you feel like it could be beneficial? And I've also read that it, the same calories consumed in the morning are burned faster than if they were consumed later in the day. So how do you feel about, no, you know what Here's I'm getting what at. I know. You feel like it's more beneficial to have a later in the day. No, I'm, I, I don't believe there is a universal best window. Okay. And I, I am a hundred percent would, would stand by that statement based on, you know, my podcast intermittent fasting stories, you know, okay. today I did episode number, I don't know, like 264. I've talked to a lot of people That's awesome. and everyone finds they have a very strong preference for the time of day of their eating window. A lot of us gravitate towards a late afternoon evening window. I actually did a survey that I talked about in fast feast repeat um, in a Facebook group that I had several years ago. And I said, what is your preferred eating window time? And people answered it. Most people chose afternoon to evening and some people chose midday. A few people chose morning. That's when they feel their best with the morning eating window. But most of us who do not find that a morning eating window is our best eating window, we, we mean it. It really is not a great window for us. But there are people that are equally as emphatic that that is the time they feel best when they eat. So it's all about figuring out your study of one. You know, my, my um, word of choice here is bio-individuality. We're not all the same when it comes to what time we want to go to bed, what time we naturally wake up in the morning. We're not the same with, with anything like that. So why would we think that everyone has the same time that eating is going to work best for them? You know, as far as like the idea of cortisol, you know, I've had my cortisol tested a few times okay. over the years that I've been fasting. It's always very low. Okay. So fasting is, it's not one of those things that's like guaranteed to increase your cortisol. That's, yeah. that's kind of a myth. You know, people okay. keep throwing that around and people are like, oh my God, cortisol. I'm like, well, if you're worried, have your cortisol tested. Yeah. If your cortisol is not high, then stop worrying about cortisol because they can do that test for you very, very easily. My cortisol has always been very low, like I said, and I am in you know, evening eating window person. And my cortisol always was tested early in the morning because that's when I, you do fasted blood work. But I'm not like, you know, having super high, crazy cortisol levels. Now, okay. does that mean that fasting could not increase cortisol? It could, but it depends on you. You know, I have a chapter in Fast Feast Repeat called Tweak It Till It's Easy. And your intermittent fasting lifestyle should feel easy. Not while you're adjusting, while you're adjusting, it's hard. Your body's learning to do something new. But once you find a rhythm and a routine that feels good, it's not making you more stressed. It's not making you more whatever. It, it's bringing you peace. That's what you're trying to do. You need to find something that feels good long-term. And something that feels good long-term, that's your body letting you know that it's not creating more stress. It actually creates less stress in my life because I'm not having to worry about, should I eat? Can I eat? Is it time to eat? What should I eat? I'm not even thinking about that. I'm just fasting. Later, I'll eat. It's just, it's absolutely relaxed and, and not a problem at all. What about raising cholesterol? Because I've kind of read that too, that fasting can raise cholesterol levels. Have you read that or have seen well, that? Okay, oh yeah, life? there's something called transient um, hypercholesterolemia, I okay. probably pronounced that a little bit wrong, but transient meaning temporary hyper meaning high cholesterol. And that's not fasting. It's fat loss that does that. So there's a, a journal article that I, people, whenever they ask me about it, I just bloop, here's the journal article, read it yeah. <laughs> about, no, about right. the transient level of it. Because if you're losing fat through any method, mm -hmm. any method at all, cholesterol can go up. It's transient because it's part of while you're losing weight. So, you know, if you understand that's what's happening, you're like, oh, look, there's a marker that shows I'm losing fat and it's not a big deal because you would expect to see that if you're losing fat. But again, it's not just fasting. The article that, that I share, the journal article is not about fasting. It's about weight loss and high cholesterol just in general. Okay. Maybe you could send that to me and I could link it because that is a question okay. that comes yeah, up. I'd be glad to. So people like then sometimes think they need to like monkey around with their fasting window or fasting time, like four days before they go get their blood work, just so they make it look better. I'm like, no, you want your blood work to reflect what you're doing. Right. And if you understand why it's up 
and you can share with your doctor, here's a journal article. This is why it's up. I'm not concerned. Let's keep our eye on it. Then, then you're not like worried about it. You understand why. And when you understand why, you don't need to like falsify what your blood work is you right, know, right, by right. changing things up. So I'm a believer in look at what's really happening that reflects what you're doing, but understand why it looks like that. Well, the truth is, if there's some way that we can complicate things, we will. That's true. <laughs> it's true, it's true. And fasting um, is, is not complicated. It's so yeah. simple. But yeah, but it's, yeah, but you know, it does seem complicated with yeah, all these questions. Um, but the truth is what we found about with any disease, including heart disease, that it's inflammation yeah. causing the problem. So, and guess what lowers inflammation amazingly well? Fasting. Absolutely. That's yeah. right. That's right. Um, so yeah, I mean, as far as the cholesterol thing, I think it's really important to realize that, you know, it's, we need to <laughs> tone down the inflammation in our body. Right. Um, so intermittent fasting is awesome for that. How do you feel about, well, what do you feel is the benefits of one meal a day? Well, one meal a day is, is really a funny phrase that has taken on so many different things. And I consider myself someone who follows a one meal a day lifestyle, but we actually had the first Facebook group called one meal a day intermittent fasting back in 2015 is when I started that Facebook group. And our whole approach was that we structure our eating window around one meal of your day. Maybe you structure it around the breakfast hour or, or the, the lunch period or the dinner time. But that what that doesn't mean is 23-1. You know, one meal a day is not one plate a day or one hour of eating a day. You okay. know, I want you to think about if you've ever been to like a, a fine dining experience that, that lasted several hours. You're at a fine restaurant and it's you're having one meal. If you were at that restaurant for four hours, you didn't have two meals. Yeah. It's still one meal, but you started with maybe you had an appetizer and then a little while later you had the salad course and then you had your main course. Maybe you finished it up with dessert, still one meal. So that's very much the way I live my one meal a day lifestyle. It's very unusual for me to have a one hour window. And we actually don't recommend that you're that restrictive day in and day out okay. because your body can adapt to that. You know, if you, if you have a tight, you know, 60 minute window every single day of your life, your body's going to reach homeostasis and you're more likely to plateau there and you're just going to stay there. I'm somebody who switches it up. You know, one day I have a longer window because I was hungrier that day. Yeah. You know, another day I have a really short window because I was busy. The next day I'm hungrier because I had a short window the day before. So you, you're you not stuck in a rigid way of living. But I actually don't define one meal a day as 23-1 or one plate a day. And I don't recommend that people stick to that long term anyway, okay. like I just explained. So, yeah. but, okay. but I, I structure my eating window around the dinner time of the day, right? Mm -hmm. Like I open my window late afternoon with a little starter. Later, I cook dinner and have that, then a little something desserty kind of, you know, to close my window. I didn't eat two full meals, it was still one meal just spread out, maybe over a four hour period. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. makes total sense. Thank you for clarifying that because yeah, I just wonder, cause been, you tell that to people and they're like, forget that. <laughs> not doing that. That's crazy. <laughs> um, well, something to think about though, when you're thinking about when would be a good time to have your window is like when you eat, I mean, right. It stimulates more hunger and then yeah. you're, you, you're hungrier and then you want to eat more and then you have the insulin. And so it is true. Like the eating, if you're going to start in the morning with your window, then you have to remember that. That's why I can't, I, I cannot have a morning. I mean, there are people that do beautifully with the morning eating window, but yeah. I can't, you know, I can start like I, over time. Like I remember when I was trying to lose weight, which of course I'm not anymore, but when I was, I'd be like, I'm just going to shift. Cause I was like following a five hour daily eating window approach. I'm like, I'm going to shift it and have this big breakfast and all that. And then it'll be just plenty of food. And then I'll close my window. Well, that's all well and good. But about eight hours later, I'm still wide awake. It's the middle of the afternoon and now I'm starving. Yeah. And it's that's miserable. That's all you're thinking about. <laughs> so, yeah. And I'm miserable. Whereas right. when you go to bed, like I have my eating window in the afternoon, I go to bed, I wake up, I'm already, you know, what, 12 hours into the fast when I wake up in the morning. So you know, my body is already on that, you know, 
part of the, I'm not on that blood sugar roller coaster where I'm looking for something else. I'm already in the fasted state. You know, my body flips that metabolic switch and, you know, now I don't need to eat. But once you have a little something to eat, now your body's like, all right, you're no longer in fat burning mode, you're in sugar burning mode and your body demands some more. And that's when you get hangry. Well, also you think about, you really shouldn't be eating three to four hours before bed anyway, because like you talk, you know, what the importance of sleep and your brain and what it's doing for us. And we don't want to steal from what it needs to do for digestion. Well, I actually, I actually eat you know, maybe around seven thirty, eight o'clock, close my window and I'm in bed maybe an hour to two hours later. So I don't oh, like wow. have that long period of the time. Okay. I sleep better when I have just had something to eat not too long before. I mean, look, I always think about lions after the feast, they go right to sleep, right? Oh, wow, yeah. They eat, then they they sleep you know, they're, while they're digesting. I, what we don't want to do is eat all day up into the night and okay. right before bed. But people need to figure that out for themselves. You know, there are people who have trouble with reflux if they eat a yeah. lot and then lay down you know, I don't, I'm not eating a giant amount of food that, you know, if I had yeah. like a big steak dinner at eight o'clock and yeah. then tried to go to bed, I would not right. feel well. But, you know, by the time I'm finished eating, maybe around seven thirty or eight, and then I'm ready to get in bed around nine thirty, something like that. But really it's all about how you feel. Your body will let you know if you've eaten too close to bedtime for you, but I sleep great if, if I eat, you know, the period of time when I eat and then I go to bed. When I tried to switch my window, like I don't know, maybe about a, just over a year ago. I was like, let me see because I'm retired now. I'm at home. Yeah. And um, I mean, I'm actually working really hard, but I don't have to go to work. <laughs> right, <laughs> I mean, right. I'm working here, you know, right, right, <laughs> but right. I, I said, what if I have my main meal more around two? You know, cause I was eating my main meal around seven, but what if I have my main meal around two and then finish it up with something light later and just shift it downward? It really started affecting my sleep. I didn't sleep as well. Wow. So. It's a matter of figuring out what works best for your body. Yeah. You know, all those things that we're told, you must do this, you must not do that. So many of those things are just myths because we're different. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. What about diabetics? I get a, a lot of questions about this type one, type two. What is your recommendation for diabetics? That's a great question. And for diabetics, there's really, I mean, I talk about in Fast Feast Repeat, I have a section about type 2 diabetes and fasting, um, or I talk about Dr. Jason Fung, the work, work he's doing with diabetics and with fasting and reversing type 2 diabetes, the reversing. So people are no longer considered diabetic after they live an intermittent fasting lifestyle. They have their insulin levels come way down. So when your insulin levels are down, you know, your blood sugar levels are, are now normal, right? You don't need extra insulin because your blood sugar is down low and normal. And so it can reverse type 2 diabetes. I would recommend, you know, reading the diabetes code for anyone who's interested in that um, by Dr. Jason Fung. But I can't think of anything better. You know, type 1 diabetes is because your body's not producing enough insulin to manage your blood sugar. Your pancreas isn't working. Right. Type 2 diabetes is very much the opposite. It's a disease of too much insulin. And we have so much insulin that our body becomes insulin resistant. And the insulin's no longer doing its job. And that's when blood sugar starts to climb in the type 2 diabetic. Um, but it's, it's the opposite problem. It's too much insulin. Right. And, and that is what creates the problem. So we've got to get insulin down. What gets insulin down? Nothing gets it down better than fasting. So, right. and as far as the type 1 diabetic, you know, that's certainly not my expertise because it's a whole different thing. Um, it's, it's new, like I said, kind of the opposite problem, not enough insulin. So can type one diabetics fast? Absolutely. I recently, I can't think of her name, Lucy. I can't think of her last name. I just recently interviewed a type one diabetic who heard me on another podcast with that's um, hosted by a type one diabetic called the juice box podcast. So she heard me on that. And then she came onto my podcast. She started her own podcast. Um, as a type one diabetic. Oh, wow. And she talked about how intermittent fasting has just changed her life as a type one diabetic. Wow. Of course, you have to look, you have to really keep your eye on your blood sugar in a different way than someone who is not a type one diabetic. But um, it's amazing to talk to her. And I'm glad she heard me on the other podcast yeah. and then was able to um, implement it 
and begin intermittent fasting and start her own podcast related to intermittent fasting for type one diabetics. That's great to know. What a great resource, because yeah, that's a big question, you know, um, can they do it? So here's who can't do it. You can't do it if you're pregnant. You can't do it if you're breastfeeding and you shouldn't do it if you have an eating disorder without talking to your counselor first, you must have total supervision and guidance. That's it. And you know, you know, if if you're, or or you're severely underweight, obviously you don't want to fast, but re and children, people who are not finished growing other than that, I can't make any blanket statements about people should not do it. A lot of people don't understand why I've had that question about being pregnant. Why can't you right. fast? So what, what do you say? Like, why? I mean, well, there's, there's a lot of reasons why, first of yeah, all, yeah. even Cecily, Cecily Ganhart, the OBGYN, um, who I interviewed that uses fasting with her patients is like, not while you're pregnant. You know, we don't have research on that and you want to provide nutrients for your baby. You need to be eating while you're pregnant. Also, This is something interesting to keep in mind. And this is also why we don't recommend it during breastfeeding. Because so often people think the reason we don't want people to do intermittent fasting um, while they're breastfeeding, they think it has to do with milk supply. They're like, Mm -hmm. well, I have plenty of milk supply. It's not a problem. There's no no problem here. And actually, that's not why. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that could be why. But deeper than that, and this goes to my my most recent book, Cleanish, you know, eat mostly clean, live mainly clean and unlock your body's natural ability to self-clean. And basically we are just full of toxins now from our lifestyle, just everywhere we go, you know, you're in the bathroom at the airport and it's spraying air freshener in your face. You know, you're getting all these chemicals, you know, you're drinking out of a, a plastic bottle, you're getting those chemicals. I mean, just everywhere you go, they're, they're chemicals in our environment. Well, what do our bodies do with these toxic chemicals? Some of them they stash in our fat stores. They're like, I don't know what this garbage is. I got to do something with it. You know, like if you're cleaning up your room and you put stuff under your beds, so you don't have to look at it. Your body does that, stashes it in your fat stores. So when you're breastfeeding your baby, the last thing you want to be doing is having your body emptying out your fat stores with all these stored toxins. Now they're going to go into your breast milk. So really, we don't want to be focusing on trying to lose fat while we're breastfeeding because your body has stored those toxins away in your in your fat stores. Now they're going to release them and it's going to go into your breast milk and it's going to go into your baby. You know, that wasn't a problem prior to the modern era when we didn't have all these chemicals, but you you just don't want to do that. So that's really why I recommend not doing it with breastfeeding. Obviously, milk supply is also a big thing, but we, we just have a different toxic load now than we used to. And, you know, we're so careful about what we eat while we're pregnant, right? You wouldn't right. put certain things into your body while you're pregnant or while you're breastfeeding, you wouldn't put them into your body. But you have to think about some of the things that are in your body were put into your body before you got pregnant or through just passive being in your environment. Right, right. Well, um, has anything changed Uh, with the way you fast since you started many years ago? Well, I'm a lot more intuitive about it now, really. And I used to think that when I first was doing it, it was only for weight loss. I didn't understand all the health benefits. So now I realize that I am fasting. Obviously, it helps me maintain my weight, but it's Mm -hmm. so much about longevity and aging well Mm -hmm. and for my health. So really my whole mindset towards fasting has changed. I used to think that I would want to fast the least amount that I could and still maintain my weight. Like, you know, I could do this on the weekend, and this, but now I realize that's not at all how I live. I, I want to feel good all the time. Right. So I want to choose a fasting schedule that feels good from day to day. I want to eat the foods that make me feel good. And so that's really what's changed. My focus is how can I feel my best every single day and how can I age well and be healthy long term? So that that's what I would say has changed my motivations and just the, the approach that I use day to day for that reason. Yeah, that's great. That's great. What are the biggest no's with fasting? I mean, I get that question a lot and then people like go back and forth. And so in your what you know, what is the absolute nose while you're fasting? Like, well, I, mean, you have, I like coffee in the morning yeah, and, you know. You have to know why you're fasting. Why are you fasting? You know, if you just yeah. want to do a low calorie diet, that's not fasting, right? So yeah. a lot of people are doing intermittent fasting 
and they think they're doing intermittent fasting, but they're really doing a low calorie diet. Like if you wake up in the morning and put almond milk in your coffee, you are no longer fasting. You are now doing a low calorie diet because almond milk is a low calorie food. (laughs) You know, if you were going to have surgery and they told you to fast, would you put that in your coffee? You would not. So um, that that's food for the body. So there are three fasting goals. And I talk about this in fast feast repeat. Mm -hmm. And if you understand what your three fasting goals are, then you understand what you, what you want to do during the fast. First of all, we want to keep our insulin low, which I've talked about before. That's, that's what fasting is great for. Well, what causes our body to release insulin? Eating. Well, of course we're not going to eat, but also when our brain thinks that we have food coming in, um, there's something called the cephalic phase insulin response, which happens in the brain. So let's say I was drinking a, a diet soda. You know, we've all heard about diet sodas our whole lives and how great they are for you because they have zero calories. They're great if you're trying to lose weight. Actually, no. You taste that sweetness of that diet soda and your brain says, I know what this is. This is something sweet. Sweetness comes with a high load of sugar because in nature, think about that. It's honey or fruit or sugar. Something like that is what tastes sweet. And so your brain says, we're going to need some insulin to deal with this sugar that's coming in, not understanding that it's zero calorie artificial sweetener because that doesn't exist in nature. And so your body pumps out some insulin in response to this sweet taste, but you didn't really need that insulin because it's a zero calorie. It's not going to raise your blood sugar because it doesn't have have any sugar in it. So we want to keep our insulin low so we don't take in anything that might lead to a cephalic phase insulin response. And that would be anything that tastes sweet, or reminds your brain of food. Like you don't want to put cinnamon in your coffee. You don't want to have apple cider vinegar. You don't want to put lemon in your water. All of those things could cause your body to have an insulin response. Anything that's food-like. All right, the second thing we want to do during the fast is we want to tap into our stored fat for fuel. That's one of the things that we, we really want to do. The mental clarity comes from being in ketosis. You know, we're burning fat. That's one of our goals. And so... To tap into our stored fat for fuel, we have to give our body a reason to access it. So if you're putting MCT oil in your coffee, your body is going to use that fat. It might make a lot of ketones from that fat in your coffee cup, but it's not making them from the fat cells on your body already. We want our body to tap into our fat cells. So you want to avoid cream, butter, coconut oil, all of that. Because would you rather burn the body, the body fat? or the fat from your coffee cup? Mm -hmm. I think most people know the answer to that. Now, if you're trying to gain weight, you know, obviously you don't want to fast. Anyway, you should be eating more. Um, But most of us are not trying to gain weight while we're fasting. So we don't want to add sources of fat to Mm -hmm. our coffee. It doesn't make any sense. And the third fasting goal is to have increased autophagy. Autophagy is our body's cellular cleanup. And we recycle old junky proteins and you scrounge around and clean things up. And autophagy, you know, as we age, naturally goes down because our bodies get busy doing other things. But fasting actually increases our levels of autophagy, which is one reason that we believe that fasting is going to lead to increased longevity and also healthy aging because our levels of autophagy will be high. Well, what turns off or turns down autophagy? Eating, especially protein. So if you're having like bone broth or something, that's going to stop autophagy. And that's not what we want. So when you understand that, you realize you don't want to have something that's tricking your brain to releasing insulin when your brain's not releasing your insulin, your pancreas is releasing it, but you know what I mean? (laughs) Your brain sends the signal. We don't want to have that cephalic phase insulin response. And we also want to tap into our stored fat. We want to have increased autophagy. So what can you have? You can have plain water, plain sparkling water. I'm drinking my my Topo Chico unflavored mineral water right now. Um, You can have black coffee, plain tea. And I'm talking about real tea. You know, there's a whole herbal tea aisle and most of those things are not really tea. You know, like cinnamon afternoon delight is is not going to be what you want to have. You know, all those dessert type herbal teas, anything with a hint of sweetness you don't want. A bitter flavor profile does not cause your body to have the cephalic phase insulin response. So that's why black coffee and and plain tea are okay for the fast. You know, black coffee actually has been linked to increased autophagy 
So that's a good thing. Yeah. Thanks for covering that about the MCT oil because it's super yeah. popular. I mean, I, I think know. there's probably a lot of benefits to it, but maybe just not while you're fasting. Well, and if you need you extra ketones because you have seizure disorder or, you know, you might have dementia and you need extra ketones, you might want more ketones than your body can produce, in which case that would be a benefit. But for the rest of us, you know, if you don't have dementia and you're not having a seizure disorder, there is no reason to add that. I mean, you might be like, yes, but it makes me so mentally sharp. Well, you know what else makes you mentally sharp? Fasting clean and letting your body make the ketones yeah, that way. That's so true. Let your body do. We don't just want ketones. We want the process of that happening in our liver. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, that makes total sense. You're right. Um, well, what is the last thing? Let's talk about the last thing about fasting is what okay. is the most common question that you get about fasting? Well, the most common thing I hear, let me just say, is that people will say, I tried that and it didn't work for me all the time. I hear that. And I'm like, well, okay, let's talk about that. And almost a hundred percent of the time, there are two reasons that are the same for, for these people. And probably both of them are true, not fasting clean. They're like, uh, so I always say, well, what were you drinking? And they're like, well, I was drinking, you know, Powerade Zero, or I was putting, I was having Bulletproof coffee, or I was putting Stevia, or I was using nut pods or whatever. They were not fasting right. clean. Right. The second thing is they didn't give it enough time. They said, well, you know, I did it for two weeks and I gained a pound and it didn't work. And so I quit. And so in the 28 day fast start that I talk about in fast feast repeat, the first 28 days are not your weight loss phase. And they're not the phase where you're going to feel amazing. Mm -hmm. It's where you're learning how to do something new. Your body is learning how to be metabolically flexible. You have to get fat adapted. You're not going to feel your best. And you're also not going to be tapping into your fat stores efficiently yet. You're getting your insulin down. So you might actually gain a little weight because if you're not tapping into your fat stores very well during the fast, because your body hasn't learned how to do that yet, when your, your window opens, you're going to be starving and you're yeah. likely to overeat. But that yeah. feeling goes away after you adjust to fasting. Finally, one day you feel good during the fast, then your window opens and you eat a normal amount of food or even less than normal and you feel satisfied and you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so you know, not fasting clean and not giving it enough time. Those are the two reasons people find that it, you know, quote, doesn't work for them. Wow. Yeah, that makes sense. In your book, um, we're going to talk about cleanish. Yeah. Yes, you mentioned something I feel is important and that is becoming obsessed with being healthy. And yeah. I feel that is a huge problem when it yeah. comes to food and fasting. It's like a religion for people yeah. and it's like this obsession. So what is your suggestion for that? Like, how do you overcome that? Because I know with me, I sit, sometimes I will sit and worry about every little thing and I'm like, what yep. you, you know, really? So well, you that's where the, the ish comes in, right? The book yeah, is called yeah. clean ish because we've yeah. all gone down the rabbit holes of trying to be perfect and it's impossible. Yeah. You can't, you can't avoid every toxin in your environment. You can't eat only pure food. And there's a term called orthorexia and it's not a, um, it's not yet a recognized disorder like anorexia or mm -hmm. bulimia, but it's a proposed disorder. And the, um, the psychiatrist or psychologist, I can't remember which, which he is, who came up with the term suffered from it himself. And he understood it. And in his book about orthorexia, I think his name is Dr. Stephen Bratman. Um, and he talks about his whole journey through orthorexia. And I, I retold the story in Fast Feast Repeat, but his book is really good. He talks about how he was just obsessed with, with perfect eating. And he followed this path of going down, you know, what was perfect eating. And he kept listening to different people and he would change what he was eating and going down the path. And they came full circle till finally someone recommended the thing he'd been doing at first. Right. Yeah. And he's like, wait, yeah. this is crazy. Because if you listen to all the voices, you'll be scared of everything. I mean, even water becomes scary if you start talking about it because your know, water is contaminated. Which bottle should you drink right. it out of? Right. I mean, this bottle, that bottle, can I buy it at the convenience store? Is that bottle, right. bottled water killing me? I mean, everything is scary now. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to decide, you know, I can't, I can't worry about everything. You just can't. Or you will be crazy. You will not be able to go out into public. You won't be able to live your life. So when you start feeling like you're unable to live your life, 
that's when you know it's gone too far. And you may want to start talking to a counselor because, you know, you want to feel good. Our bodies are actually really good at managing toxins. Unfortunately, we've overloaded them. So it's got too much to do. But if we work on bringing things down, our bodies can do what they need to do. So we do what we can. You know, what is it? The, um, you know, God, the serenity prayer. I can never say it exactly right. God grant me the serenity to, you know, basically know what I can change and work on those things and accept the things I can't. And in our lives, you know, you're going to go to the airport and they're going to spray that stuff in your face. And yeah. it's all, you just can't, can't be perfect. Right. Right. That's yeah. so true. I just thought that was something that you devoted some time on. And I thought that's really good to well, talk it's about that because you don't yeah. want that to happen. I don't want people to be afraid to live. Right. Was there anything that surprised you in your research for this book? Well, really, it was just how bad it really is. You know, I just said not to worry about it. And I'm going to tell you this, like when people, we did a book study when the book first came out in my community and people were reading it and they're like, oh my God, now I'm so overwhelmed. I don't, right. I'm putting it down. I can't learn any more of this. And so, you know, trying to, um, to understand that knowledge is power. When yeah. you start reading cleanish and you start working through it and realizing like, like fragrance, for example, all the chemicals that are, are labeled as fragrance right. you know, and, and like certain products um, are actually like certain products that you are supposed to be put on your skin might be more dangerous to you than cleaning products that are designed for your kitchen countertops, you know, and, and just realizing that these things are everywhere you can just feel like this is too big. I can't do anything. Yeah. It's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot, but like lot. I said, ignorance might be bliss, but it isn't really. So when you understand it, you can start making small changes and change. You just swap out the things that, that are easy to swap out and focus on those things first. And like I said, knowledge is power and you can make the changes that matter the most. You feel, um, what do you feel you've changed the most in your own life since writing this book? Well, I realized I was just such a victim of, of a phrase called greenwashing that I talk about in the book. Yeah, greenwashing, that. yeah, that is how companies make you think that their products are clean and green and healthy, and they're really, really not. You know, we just went through this. We have a son who's 22, and he had been staying with us for a while, and he was drinking, I don't know what he had, some nonsense. And my husband said, you should drink some juice instead of that. And he's like, okay. So he came back with this carton of, of fruit punch. Okay. And like the number one ingredient was um, like corn syrup. And it had artificial. I mean, it was terrible. It was a horrible product. But you read the words on the back of it. And it was talking about how wholesome and blah, 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 and made with real juice, with real juice. That product was completely greenwashing our son. He thought it was something that was really good for you. It even had artificial sweeteners in it. And that was not disclosed anywhere on the label until you read the ingredients at like sucralose or something. And, you know, if, if you didn't understand what to look for on a label, you know, if you just look calories to calories, it had less calories than like organic orange juice. Mm -hmm. So you might think this is a better choice, but it's not. And so I realized how often I had been victim of greenwashing. Like there was a brand of um, cleaning products that I used that I thought were very, you know, clean and green because that's how they're sold to us. And then I started looking things up on the environmental working groups app. They have an app and it's free and you can look products up and they rate them. And these products were rated really, really badly. Like the one that I was using as my dishwashing liquid um, rated worse than that blue dishwashing liquid that we all see in the commercials where they're cleaning the animals off from the oil spill, you know. And I, if you had look, put those two side by side and said, which is better, I would have picked the one I was using all day long. Mm. But it turns out the blue option would have been a better choice. Mm. So, I mean, I did not switch to the blue option. I found one that was even better than that by using the app. But, you know, you may think that you're doing a really good job. And then when you start looking at the products, you realize you're not. That was the part that was most surprising to me. But then I realized it really is easy to change. Like I found a, a brand of cleaning products that rated very, very highly. 
and works fabulous. So I, you know, I switched to that, my, my, using it in the laundry, using it. It's just wonderful. It all starts with the same concentrate and it's, it's very effective. And it was a very easy change to make. So it is doesn't it have counter? to be hard. Hmm? Is it over the counter? Well, the, the brand I use is called Branch Basics. Okay. I have a link to it at jenstevens.com slash cleanish. Okay. Um, and you buy the concentrate and it lasts forever. And you like okay. make your laundry detergent out of it. And you can add like your own essential oils for the smell. Like I add a little peppermint essential oil if you want it to have a little scent to it. But yeah. Okay. Wow. And it's so easy. To, it's It's cheaper over the long run versus buying mm-hmm. stuff. You just have to be prepared. You have to know when you're about to run out of the concentrate, but okay. you know, you're not going to have to like mix your own stuff up out of vinegar and whatever. Oh, good. No, yeah, yeah you don't have to do that. <laughs> I'm not work. using vinegar and baking soda to clean my, <laughs> clean my house, you know? <laughs> well, it's funny. I just watched a video by Dr. Berg this morning. I love Dr. Berg. He has every yeah. video in the world about everything you'd possibly want to. And he was talking about the toothpaste. Like yep. everything in the healthy toothpaste, he's like, oh no, he, he gave a recipe like with four things yeah. that was way better than just any toothpaste. I was like, wow. Um, so speaking of fruit punch um, and red dye, you talk about this in your book, red dye and the effects on children. And now that I'm seeing a lot of more children in my practice, I bring this up to the parents. So maybe you could touch on your experience with that and what the correlation with red dye is with behavior and even migraines and allergies in children. Right. Well, and it's not even just red dye. It's even broader than that. It's artificial flavors, artificial colors, preservatives, and even certain compounds in real foods. So let me backtrack to when my son, the one who's 22, he'll be 23 in two days. When he was a little fella and he was in daycare, he started having just horrible tantrums, like uncontrollable and he got kicked out of one daycare and then another daycare. And then we finally put him in a, What's going a, on? I know we put him in a little private school, it was a little Christian private school. And they, I was like, they'll take him, you know, <laughs> and then, right, they have to, they have to, and he was having a hard time there. But one day when I was picking him up, his teacher said he had a really hard day today. What did he eat for breakfast? I'm like, well, that, and by then I'd been a teacher for like a long time. I was like, that's a ridiculous question. Okay. He had cat in the hat cereal. And it was a cereal that had like little cat in the hat hats and you put the milk on it and it all turned red or whatever. And I'm like, well, you had cat in the hat cereal. She's like, you might want to go look into red dye and behavior. I'd never heard of that. This is around, I don't know, 2002, 2003, something like that. I'm like that sounds ridiculous. But right. <laughs> I went right. home and fired up the computer. I think I looked on Yahoo and started searching for that. And I found that, oh my gosh, there is a connection between food additives in behavior in children. And that led me to an organization called the Feingold Organization. And Dr. Benjamin Feingold was a a physician in California. And he actually was really widely known in like the 70s and the 80s. He went on Phil Donahue, if anybody's old enough to remember that show, (laughs) and talked about it then. And he was doing work with, you know, what we called ADD or hyperactivity um, Mm -hmm. in children. And that, of course, that's what they were calling it then. But he was doing work between food additives and children's behavior. And so it turns out when you remove certain things from the diets of the children, they no longer have these attention problems. And it was fascinating. And so I took all that out of, out of we have, have two sons. I took it out of both of their lives just because it was easier to have them eat the same thing. And we found both of them had better behavior. It made a huge difference. So we were able to go through, I am certain we were on our way to some sort of a diagnosis. Um, I mean, we were going to probably get an ADHD diagnosis. I'm sure we would have gotten you know, the, the ADHD drugs. Yeah. You know, he would have been able to function. But instead, we cleaned up his diet. We cleaned up the products we were using because we found out the things on your skin, things that you inhaled. He was very sensitive to all of that. And, you know, that brings me to a concept called the bucket effect. Yeah. I actually learned about that then. I believe it might have been through um, a book by Dr. Doris Rapp. Um, she was a, a medical doctor. And the name of her book is, Is This Your Child? She wrote it maybe in the 80s. It's a really thick book, but she was an environmental allergist. And she found that... Um, so many of the problems she was seeing in her children and the children in the practice were related to environmental things, mm-hmm. not just what they're eating, but what they inhale, what you put on your skin. 
And, and that just really, you know, you think, okay, let me go back to the bucket effect. I kind of got off the topic there a little bit. Okay. Think about a bucket, I kind of visualize a bucket and think of your body as that bucket. Now imagine the bucket is, you got a leak in your roof and you put the bucket under the leak and the water's dripping in, drip, 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 water dripping into your bucket. Eventually, the bucket's going to be full and the water is going to overflow. And then you're going to have water everywhere. Well, your body is like that bucket and the toxins coming in are like that water drip. You know, they're dripping in, dripping in, dripping in. Now we all have a different size bucket. It might have to depend on your gut health lot of factors, your overall health in general. Some people have a small bucket. Some people have a larger bucket. You know, if someone has Lyme disease, their bucket's already pretty full with that. You know, you're not going to be able to handle as much other stuff coming in before your bucket's going to overflow. But his bucket, our son, his bucket was overflowing. And every time something went in there, it would overflow and it would Act, he would act out. His were, were behavior type symptoms, but it could be so many other things. It could be allergies. It could be asthma. It could be a, it, it manifesting itself in a lot of different ways. So what we did, we changed his diet. We changed what we used. It lowered his toxic load. Mm-hmm. He was able to handle it. It made such a difference. Yeah. And even like thinking of red or, or that stuff, it's like you think of Doritos and just yeah. anything that's got all of that. All of it. It's like, wow. And it even could be natural foods that are inflammatory or causing a problem for that person. Like, for example, Will was very sensitive to a class of foods called salicylates. You know, Mm -hmm. probably everyone knows someone who was allergic to aspirin, for example. Aspirin is a natural salicylate. Well, salicylates are found in foods like grapes or apples. And, And it's natural. And it's actually like a natural pesticide that these plants make to keep the pests off. But Will responded to all of those. If you gave him, you know, apple juice, he, that that caused him to have a problem. So we had to eliminate all the salicylate foods as well for him. It made such a difference. But the Fine Gold organization, for anyone who's like, wow, I really want to look into that, finegold.org, they're still around today. They have a lot of resources for parents. They have a book you can download, the first part of it for free, a lot of resources. And um, it really just saved us. And, and him, because we went, he was not medicated. He went through his entire childhood. He even skipped a grade wow. you know, after we got it under control. And it made such a difference in our lives. And it well, really yeah. got me interested in the whole idea of toxins and what we were putting into our bodies and on our bodies and smelling. Yeah. Well, with the prevalence of these disorders like ADHD and all that, you know, in all of the new all of the artificial world we're living in, it makes total sense that there's a connection. And even like with adults, like mood and just everything that we're putting in, how it affects our body. It's just crazy. There's a book that I also read around that time called Brain Allergies. And the foreword was written by Linus Pauling, who y'all probably have heard of as like the guy with vitamin C. He won a Nobel Prize for his work with vitamin C. But Linus Pauling wrote the foreword to this book. And it's a very obscure book, but it talks about your know, brain allergies. So many of the, the problems that, that we're, we're having, you know, the mental illness, like we would all agree that mental illness and mental problems are hugely on the rise. Yeah. But this book, Brain Allergies, talks about how it's, it's these chemicals in the brain that when people are you're exposed to something that, that's making their brain kind of misfire. And the book explains it a lot better than I can. Yeah, but I right. that book really explained a lot to me. Like they told the story, for example, of a guy who delivered diesel fuel or something. He was a trucker and he became sensitive to diesel fuel smell and it would make him like psychotic. As long as he stayed away from it, he was fine. But they made that connection. And again, you're, when your bucket is full, things can come out in all sorts of different ways. It might be allergies. It might be you know, something with your mood, your behavior, sleep, yeah, so many you, things. Yeah. You go into, I, com- yeah, yeah. I completely lost my seasonal allergies. I no longer have seasonal allergies. Wow. That's Cause awesome. my bucket is low enough that the pollen no longer sends it, you know, overflowing like it used to. Wow. Um, you talk about that. You go through a lot in the book about that. Maybe how we know if we're having toxic overload or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but I felt what was interesting is like the things we don't think about, like our body has a lot of processes, self-cleaning processes to help us get rid of those things. 
But yet you talked about how some of these things continue to be stored in our body. You talked about it being um, persistent, bioaccumulative and Mm -hmm. toxic. So maybe just summarize what that means um, and how our body, some of the ways our body does deal with these things. Well, like, like I mentioned before, one way it stashes them away in your fat cells and just yeah. keeps them there. And you know that adds to your overall body burden because the toxins are still there because your body doesn't know what to do with it. You know, I use the analogy in the book of, of Lucy and Ethel in the chocolate factory. You know, if everybody's seen that scene when they're working in the, cho- in the chocolate factory and they're supposed to like wrap up the candy or something and it's coming by on the conveyor belt and they're able to manage it at first and they're like, this is easy. And then the conveyor belt speeds up and it's it's going so quickly by that they can no longer manage it. Now they're shoving the chocolate down their shirts and under their hats and stashing it away. That's what your body's doing. Your body is able to manage the conveyor belt of toxins that are coming in Mm -hmm. until it becomes too much. And then your body stashes it away, just like Lucy and Ethel did. They put, puts it wherever it can and it bioaccumulates. It gets stored in your tissues. It gets stored in your fat cells. And so we really want to slow the amount that's coming in. And we also want to support our body as it takes it out. And so there are a lot of ways we can do that. Intermittent fasting is one of those self-cleaning mechanisms Mm -hmm. that we've got. You know, Cleanish is not an intermittent fasting book. So people who are like, yeah, I don't want to do any intermittent fasting. Cleanish is still for you because it's just one of those tools in the toolbox. And you may want to eventually once you read it and see how great it is for you. But, you know, our, our, body has all these organs, you know, our liver, for example, our kidneys, our skin, and we can support our body's natural detoxification pathways. Turns out nutrients are very important in that process. And that's what we're eating. You know, we've been so misled um, with, with the whole idea of what nutrients even really are. Because I remember growing up, you know, child, and I was in elementary school in the 70s, growing up into the 80s, and, you know, learning about, we learned about the four food groups back then, and we learned about vitamins and minerals, and then they said, and you can take vitamins, and that will give you the vitamins. So I was like taking my Flintstones and vitamin, thinking I was getting everything that I needed. No, (laughs) there are literally thousands of phytochemicals in foods. And we as humans are like guessing at what we think the most important ones are, but we haven't even identified all the the chemicals in those foods. Um, You know, Hippocrates said thousands of years ago, let your food be your medicine. And it's true. So all those phytochemicals work in conjunction with our liver, for example, to help us do the natural detoxification. Like it's our, our liver's working and it's doing all those chemical reactions, turning things into other things. And then these, these phytochemicals come in and they bind with these toxins. And they, it's, it's really important that you have those nutrients available for your body to do the work that it needs to do. And a taking a vitamin pill is not going to give you everything that you need. Now I know our soil is more depleted. Now it's, yeah. you know, the foods are not as, as nutrient dense as they mm-hmm. were, but you know, focus on organic foods, focus on diversity, eat a wide variety of foods in your diet. Those things are really, really important. Yeah. You talk about a lot about what constitutes a healthy diet. You went a great in depth on that, which I felt was really good. And, you know, we're not going to touch on all the key nutrients here because we don't have time to talk about everything, but you did go through that in the book and really in depth on really why you need to do this and a whole list of things that are going to be beneficial to support these natural processes. And it is so true. Like even our soil, we are so deficient in nutrients because of that. Even, I mean, I noticed even my own self, my hair was dry. I'm like, Mm -hmm. so I started replacing some of these things, you know, like zinc and selenium and the B vitamin. And all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, wow. Like, wow. (laughs) It really makes a huge difference just replacing those things. Um, So it's so true. When you said organic, I thought it was interesting when you mentioned in gr- the greenwashing, right. how even the organic labels can be misleading, um, like on the meat and stuff. You mentioned that. And I feel like that's important. Like what? Well, but if they use doing? the word USDA, if it's certified, USDA certified organic, you can trust that label. 
that means something, but some of the wording is, is you can't trust. And I have the whole list of in, yeah. in fast feast repeat of what the different labelings would be. I'm not fast right. feast repeat, cleanish right. and right. what, what to look for and what to ignore. But like some of the, the crazy things that they might say are like chemical free. I mean, nothing is chemical free because right. water is chemicals. You know, if you look, yeah. talk to a chemist, you know, nothing is chemical free unless you're in a vacuum. Yeah. So it's, it's just a matter of knowing what's meaningful and what isn't, you know, certain types yeah. of meat, they are not allowed to give those animal hormones ever. So putting hormone free on the package means zero because none of it has hormones in it. So it's just a matter of knowing But USDA certified organic is a label you can trust. Yeah. Okay. And it is important to eat grass fed beef instead oh, yeah. of grass fed. I mean, that is really important nutrient wise. You want to eat that. the food, the foods that you're eating should have been eating the things they're supposed to eat, that they're designed to eat. So right. with cattle, they are designed to eat out in a field, grass. That's what they're designed to eat. And so when they're feeding them corn and things they're not supposed to eat, their stomachs can't digest it. And so they get sick and then they have to have antibiotics. And then, I mean, it just, it all gets passed on to us. Right. So it really, and also the character of the meat is completely different. It has a different you know, profile of nutrients that, that you would find in there. So you want your, your food to eat the way your food was supposed to eat. Right. Right. Um, you did cover a lot about of course, carcinogens and hormone disruptors and even like toxins that affect our respiratory system specifically and our things that, def, you know, affect developmental. So you went through all that in the book. That was really great. Um, I was shocked how some of the most well, the worst products and the most toxins were like, you said like a shampoo targeted for children. Of color. Um, yeah, it was like a body a, spray. That was like number one was the yeah. product, the most hazardous product. This was they, the, the breast cancer partners. I think, I think that's the name of the yeah, organization. They did a study. They took a whole bunch of common products, cleaning products and personal care items. And they ranked all of them. And this is, when you compare the cleaning products to the personal care products, the worst, you would think it would be a cleaning product. That would right, be the worst. Right. But no, the worst was this hair care product targeted to children of color. That was the most hazardous. And they're just like putting it all over their heads. And yeah, yeah I mean, it's shocking. You would never think about that. And yes, body sprays are terrible. Yeah, you do said not buy like all those body sprays in there. Head. I was like, do wow. not buy those. Yeah, no. I mean, <laughs> Now, since I read your book, I literally look, even if it says it's like paraffin free, all these different yeah. things, it still says like fragrance or so. I'm like, okay, yeah. no, that's not good. They you can know? hide anything under the term fragrance. That's a little known labeling loophole. Yeah. And it's, it was designed to protect the company making the product so they could have their trade secret or whatever. They don't have to disclose what's in something called fragrance. So ironically, they could say it's free of whatever it is they say it's free of. But the fragrance might actually have the thing in it that they say the product doesn't have. It actually could be there hidden in the fragrance. Yeah, it's crazy. So, yeah. Um, let's just talk real quick about polyunsaturated fatty acids and how it affects our um, like chronic inflammation. I mean, that's a big root cause of many diseases. And I wanted to talk about those like, you know, are they bad? Are all of them bad? Are some of them good? And what are they doing? Well, it turns out that all of these seed oils are very inflammatory in the body. I mean, we all probably remember the shift that happened, you know, 70s, 80s, you know, people were shifting away from, you know, using lard and cooking, for example, which actually was, we shouldn't have stopped using that, but right, it turns right. out. And they were using all of these seed oils, you know, Crisco. We all remember Crisco. You might still be using Crisco. Stop using Crisco. Yeah. <laughs> and, but we were, we were told they were heart healthy, right? And, you know, saturated fat is bad. All these, you know, canola oil and all these Western oil, they, those are supposed to be so heart healthy and good for us. Turns out, no, they are very inflammatory for our bodies and they are in everything. If you look at processed foods out there, they all have these seed oils in them mm. and they're, they're just very inflammatory for our bodies. And so, you know, when, when you're trying to figure out what to eat, really real food, that that's the best, the best thing, eat real food and ultra processed food, all those things that are packaged and boxed and all of that, 
you need to look really carefully because even organic ultra processed food can have these inflammatory oils in there. You don't want organic canola oil. That's also not going to be good for your body. So, you know, the part about being clean-ish, there's the ish part. Eat mostly real food and then decide, you know, where am I going to let in some stuff that might not be perfect? Like maybe I'm, I really like, you know, crackers. So I'm going to buy organic crackers. They might have a little seed oil in there, but I'm not like going crazy with it. I make my own salad dressing, so I'm not getting all that but I'm going to have these crackers and that's okay. Mm-hmm. You, you just have to decide what you're willing to, to keep in your life and what you're willing to take out of your life. But you will never go wrong focusing on real food and eating fewer ultra-processed foods. You know, most things in health and wellness and nutrition, people disagree on so many things. Right. And you right. can find studies that say the opposite, but I've never once seen a study that indicated that ultra-processed foods are better for us. <laughs> right, right. Well, I never. did. There was <laughs> stuff saying like grapeseed oil was good for us or something. And that's why I thought I would ask you, like, what, yeah. what about coconut oils? So those are okay. Well, you, you want to stick to the 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 oils that we've had for a long time, coconut oil, okay. um, ghee, olive oil, um, avocado oil. Okay. Those, those are the ones to stick to and avoid all of the ones like the canola and sunflower okay. and safflower. What do you use instead of Crisco for like cookies and baking? Your, not that we should be. Oh cookies, yeah. I just use butter. Like around butter at the holiday. Just use butter. Mm, I okay. just use butter. Organic. Organic. Yeah. Oh yeah. I de- definitely yeah. buy organic butter. Definitely. Yeah. Cause you know, that's where when it comes to dairy products, you really want to like that. That's a priority because the toxins, you know, I talked about before how we store toxins in our fat cells. Well, so do the cows. And if, if you are having, I mean, think about what butter is. It's like the fat, right? Yeah. So what you, you don't want is non-organic dairy. So dairy is, is one of the things I will always get organic dairy if I'm buying it myself. Now, if I'm out at a restaurant and I'm having a baked potato, I'm just happy if they have real butter, it's okay. If it's not organic, I'm going to eat that butter anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Right. I know. I can't believe like I've learned so much about like the organic butter and no, like you can eat that. That's fine. I mean, but yeah, I use butter. Like if I'm, if I'm making something, I'll use butter or I'll use olive oil. Okay. Instead of, you know, like canola oil or something, it's, it's, it's a little bit frustrating because nothing fries up better than like some canola oil. It makes a nice crispy crust on something, yeah. you know, you can't do the same thing with olive oil, but I've figured out techniques for how to, mm-hmm. how to make it work. Cause I don't, I don't buy that. I do not have canola oil in my house anymore. I don't have Crisco. Yeah. No. Um, you talked about a few other s- important things that um, self-cleaning things. And it's so interesting. You brought all of these things up that are so important for us. You talked about the benefits of sauna yep. and blocking blue light and earthing and um, and even sleep. Um, those are all so important, I felt. And even like massage. I thought that was really great that you mentioned all of that and the benefits of sauna, especially been learning a lot about infrared saunas yep. and the benefits of that. I mean, what what is it about like saunas and that are so good for us? And- well, they they support your body detoxing, right? Yeah. Your your body, it kind of like revs things up and your body's able to clear out the toxins, you know, sweating in general. Yeah. Right. is a detoxification strategy. You know, you go into a yeah. steam room and, or just work up a good sweat. Your body releases toxins through your, through your skin yeah. and sauna kind of helps that. Pro- it reaches kind of deep. The infrared reaches deep and helps your body work yeah. on all those things it needs to do down there. Yeah. That's <laughs> like the latest thing, red ther- yeah. red light therapy. Like I, yeah. love, I don't know if it's working. I love earthing. But- earthing is my favorite because I love, yeah. you know, I, I now live by the beach. And so I love to walk on the sand and walk in the ocean water. And it turns out that is like phenomenally good for your body because, you know, we, we are electrical creatures, you know, yeah. we, we, you know, we've all heard of EKG. They monitor our electrical, you know, if, if we are, if our body stops with that, we die. Right. <laughs> right. right. Kind of so we, we are electrical beings. We have a charge and turns out that connecting with earth kind of helps regulate our charge. It sounds like a little woo woo or mumbo jumbo, but you can read about it in the medical journals. It's actually um, very anti-inflammatory. So I 
you know, walk, let your body touch the earth. We are meant to be in contact with the earth. And in the modern world, you know, if you're wearing shoes all the time, you never touch the earth. Yeah. I mean, think about that. You, you go outside with your shoes on, you get in your car, you walk on the pavement, you're never touching the earth. People used to sleep on the earth. They were always touching the earth in some way and very connected to it. And so we, yeah. we need to have that little discharge. Sounds woo-woo, like I said, but there's a <laughs> lot of science that supports it. I talk about it with links to the research. Yeah, and you so- do. You do. It's great. I know I was doing that. My son, my 14-year-old was like, what are you doing? And so I told him about it. He goes, that is crazy. It that, sounds no, crazy. It does sound crazy. Everybody think about how good you feel when you're walking on a field or on the grass or walking on the beach. Yeah, we know if it feels good, there's a reason it's, it's yeah. good for your body. Yeah. 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 And air quality. Mm-hmm. Um, what are a few strategies to improve this just because we don't think about it, but we should like with COVID oh, yeah. and everything. It's so important. Well, air quality is, is huge. And we learned that, yeah. like I said, when Will was little, yeah. because so many of the toxins were inhaled. And so like things that you're spraying around. So you don't want to have scented things in your environment. That is number one, get rid of anything scented candles, unless they're like essential oil, that sort of thing. But anything that's, you know, like a a plug-in, no, you don't want those. You know, the the scent of clean is no scent really. (laughs) Essential oils are, are, you know, a lot of them are, are, are fine. But you just really don't want to buy scented products, products that have fragrances added to them. Um, that's really important. You know, products have off gassing, like like carpet, for example. You know, if you need to get you know new carpet, new paint, you can buy options. Find them now that are low VOC. They don't have those volatile compounds mm-hmm. that other more traditional ones might have. Like I can remember when Will was little. We went into like a house where it was like a newly constructed house with new carpet and had that new carpet smell. We were in there for five minutes. You could see in his eyes, like you could tell when, when he was having a reaction, we called it because his eyes would change. It was like a switch was flipped and like, okay, it's this carpet, this new carpet smell. It just was filling up his bucket. So, you know, air purifiers can help. Plants can help. You know, open the windows, you know, we, we grew up with, you know, thinking about pollution as being such a problem, but really now today, our houses are so tight and we've also cleaned up environmental pollution from factories that they've been cleaned up so much. We actually probably have worse air in the house than outside the house. I believe that. scary. Yeah. Yeah. And the importance of getting kids and letting them play outside. I've read along on that, how important it is to let them get dirty. Like we're yeah, let them dig in the dirt. Yeah. It's not good for them. Um, well, I I think your book was awesome. You've had a lot of resources in there, a lot of links. Um, people can go to your website to learn more about that and connect with those links you were talking about. Because I know we went through a lot of books, a we lot did. of links, a lot of resources. Um, so I just think, what are the main takeaways in relation to our health that you feel are the most important for us to start right now? Like if you could think of just a few things that, okay, this has to change, what would be the key takeaways? Well, first of all, just start by assessing your environment and look what's around you. And and like I said, knowledge is power. Understand what you've got, what you're using and where, where you can make things, where the easy changes. Mm-hmm. Start with the easy changes. I don't want people to be overwhelmed because if you're too overwhelmed, you'll do nothing. Right. And if you do nothing, that's not helping. So take it a step by step. So when in cleanish, I very much walk you through it piece by piece. And really the first step is assessing, figuring out where you are. And then you take action where it's the most comfortable first. Like, I'm not going to tell you, here's the things you must do first. No. You have to take steps where it's most comfortable for you first, knowing that every step you take, changing your shampoo to one that's from the hazardous list to one that's good and safe Mm -hmm. will lower your toxic load. And it's an easy step. You know, choosing organic vegetables versus, you know, things out of a box or a pouch, that's an easy change. You can do those things and just 
make the changes you can. We are clean ish. You'll never, you're never going to be perfect because our environment is not perfect. Unfortunately, right. that cat is out of the bag. Right. And so you just have to do the very best you can. And, but it also really reinforces why we have to be more careful now. Like the story I told about breastfeeding and the toxins stored in the fat cells. I mean, who would think about that? Yeah. But I actually found in a, in a breastfeeding textbook, a whole you know, paragraph about why you don't want to be losing fat while you're breastfeeding. And I was like, well, that makes sense. It's the toxins. And we just don't realize all those things. It's a different world now. Yeah. Also, I mean, me being a practitioner, it's a good idea. Like there's things you can test for. I mean, you can test for heavy metals. I mean, a stool test can tell you a lot about what's going on with your gut. Um, You can do the fasting insulin test and figure out that. I mean, you can wear a continuous glucose monitor to see how things are affecting your, what is spiking your levels. I mean, there's so much we can do now to really get a good look at, you know, what our body's doing and why maybe we feel the way we do. So just thought I would mention that. Um, So what is next for you? Well, I'm just living my life. I'm enjoying my, I'm running a a community. We have a a community of intermittent fasters at jenstevens.com slash community, which I love. We we left Facebook in 2021. So it's a private community. It's a paid, paid community, but I love it. It's very, very small and maybe about 6,000 members in it right now, which I guess doesn't sound that small, but yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> Compared yeah. to Facebook, I had almost half a million members when I left Facebook yeah. and, and that was just way too big, but I'm yeah. running that community and I'm, I've got intermittent fasting stories coming out twice a week. And I love doing that. Yeah. And I have another podcast called Life Lessons with my friend, Sherry Bullock. She's the co-host and we do not talk about fasting on that. It's about all other things, okay, <laughs> anything else, enough. anything and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think I have another book or two in me coming out. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, they've been goes. great. I seriously have learned Thank so you. much and I just refer people to you and I they ask questions. I'm like, I'm not the expert in this area. You got to email Jen, <laughs> you know, take in touch with her, listen to her <laughs> well, stuff. Thank you. Um, but yeah, thanks for everything you do. You're super informative, helpful. Everything you're getting out is great. So thanks for being here again and talking. It was great. I just wish you the best of luck. Well, thank you for having me.